The History with Jackson podcast. Hello and welcome back to the History with Jackson podcast. I'm of course your host Jackson and in today's episode we talk to friend of history of Jackson and all-round great guy Oliver Webb Carter, editor and co-founder of Aspects of History. Now it was great to talk to Oliver about a wide range of, of different historical interests and controversies from the past few months but also to talk to him about content creation and different approaches and challenges within that. Now this episode originally appeared on the Aspects of History podcast feed but it is still a History with Jackson episode because we discuss some of the things that we usually discuss here at History with Jackson and we still have our final fun question. Now Aspects of History, any links that you want to check out so you can explore this fantastic platform are all in the description below and without further ado I'll leave you to myself and Oliver Webb Carter. Jackson Van Uden, welcome uh, to the podcast. And thank you very much for joining me. Oh, thank you very much for having me. I'm, I'm excited to be on. Well, Jackson, and uh, so for listeners, Jackson runs his own podcast called History with Jackson. And I just thought I'd do a little mini series with a few podcasters who run history podcasts that look quite interesting. Jackson is one of them. And... So Jackson's yours. How long has yours been running for? Quite a while, I think. Obviously, you've got plenty of episodes in there. Oh, you? Christ! It, it was three years on January the first, so it's gone through various iterations. But yeah, I've been history. Of Jackson's been around for three years, and I, I it makes me feel old saying that now. <laughs> Splendid. I don't want to dwell on the woes of podcasters because the listeners will get very bored. But um, that's that's quite a lot of hard work in three years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Quite a lot of books as well, which I'm, I'm very, I'm sure you you like that that part of the job, getting getting free books. Uh, unfortunately, I have very little room for them now. So, but that that's probably one of the woes that I have trying to fit books into my shelves. I don't really mind, but my wife does. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, I, I, I the way for the listeners' sake, the way we we're going to talk about this is, uh, I was going to cover a few of the episodes that Jackson's had that looked interesting to me and then Jackson's going to pick out a few episodes that are interesting to him and I wanted to talk about a few sort of topical issues in particular you do have quite a slant for medieval history particularly around kings and queens um I've noticed yeah I, th I think for me talking about kings and queens is it's one of those things that listeners love it always it's always something that people want to learn more about there's more and more history coming out from a different slant that's not not centered around the men of the period, which is really fascinating. Um, but also, it's it's where I started off as a historian as well. Uh, I think a lot of us got interested in history through the medieval period and then diverted across the different points based on our other interests. But it's always something I like returning to, and particularly the Crusades and the Wars of the Roses. I cannot get enough of the political and the military aspects of them. Right, so I thought then we could we could cover a bit of the princes in the tower because oh. you must have watched the documentary. Certainly okay. did, yeah. So for listeners' sake, this is maybe we, why don't we just dive in with this now? I think that's a good place to start. I think that's a good place to start. Okay, um, so this is quite a controversial topic. So for listeners who maybe um, uh, aren't familiar, the princes in the tower are the two sons of. Edward the Fourth, King Edward the Fourth, and their uncle was Richard the Third, and he uh, Jackson. Would you say this is a, a a period of history? I think you've just said that you know you, this is an area you're most familiar with. Why don't you explain it for the for the listeners, and then we can dig into some of the controversy. But but this is just a bit of familiarity for for some of the listeners who maybe aren't aware as well. Yeah, so I might I might steamroll through this quickly. So you've got a period of a lot of political turmoil in England where Henry VI, for all intents and purposes, is a pretty useless king. Um, there's some issues there that means he can't rule properly and you have a lot of usurpations, a lot of people trying to take the throne and Edward IV is one of those people who takes the throne. And after a period of consolidation, him losing the throne and coming back again, he dies quite early, he dies in his 40s. And of course, after Henry VI, who came to the throne at I think, barely a year, no one in England particularly wants a child on the throne again. Edward V was 
Uh, he was a child. Rich III, Rich Duke of Gloucester. For some reason, there are a lot of different debates. Did he accidentally end up going down this route? Did he deliberately take take the throne? Uh, but it is thought by some historians that Rich III had the two boys murdered, either with the Duke of Buckingham, either with Margaret Beaufort in uh, conspiring to help or whatever, that he had the two boys, Edward V and Richard, Duke of York, I think he was, uh, he had the boys murdered in the tower and, and usurped the throne for himself. Right. Very well summed up. So, Jackson, first question I'm going to ask you is, uh, yeah, and you've mentioned some historians believe that Richard III, wouldn't it be fair to say that the majority of historians come down on that side of things before I ask you what your view is? Yeah, from what I've seen, I think the majority of historians believe that Richard had the boys murdered. Yeah, it's it's quite a it's quite a difficult one because a lot of these sources are based on on uh, you probably see in my slant now. A lot of these sources are based off what's come out of the Tudor court, what's come out of the court of Henry the Seventh. Propaganda is a massive thing, uh, and when you're reading sources which are paid for someone or by someone to create a narrative, you are going to naturally be reading propaganda that has permeated into an accepted perspective that Richard was the one who who murdered the boys. Ah, so so you probably think he he's maligned in this regard. You don't think he necessarily did murder them. I I personally think it's something. I think if they were murdered, I'm I haven't seen enough evidence either way. To be honest, just because there's a set of bones that are labelled the boys doesn't mean that they are. And even if we test them, it and it's not them, and it opens so many more questions. I think if they were murdered, I think it was very much a a situation that just arose, very much with a Thomas A. Beckett kind of style. Well, no one rid me of these, these, these troublesome kids and something's happened. So I think it's more likely that they did die than they, they ran away. Uh, but for me, it's somewhat somewhat difficult to kind of weigh in firmly on either side and go the boys are dead Richard killed the boys or Jackie, uh, Buckingham killed the boys or both boys escaped and they went off to to Europe and and became the pretenders and so on I yeah I'm, I'm more on the side that they perhaps died but in a well no one rid me of these troublesome boys and then suddenly oh no I've got to go away with this now and, and deal with it yeah, interesting. I, I, I suspect it's it's highly likely to that Richard the Third did it, and I actually think he was right to. I don't see I don't see what the big deal is. I mean, he I don't think it's a a stain on his cat. I mean, they're children, so obviously I'm not saying that I approve of of murdering kids. Just to be clear, listeners, <laughs> but if you are a um, medieval king or you're just it'll be just on the verge of the early modern period but if you are it's to all intents and purposes a, a kind of medieval period for, for the purposes of of my argument at least if you are trying to secure your throne and, and you've got two major threats who are in the direct line even though you've argued that they are illegitimate to me it's completely natural and the right thing to do as a monarch to do it so i, I don't understand why people who are rather uh, favorable to richard the third would view this as necessarily a negative thing, despite the fact that they are kids. Because I think this is good kingly, you know, this is strong, uh, not good, that's the wrong word, strong monarchical behaviour. Yeah, no, I, I totally, totally agree. Any other king that has had usurpation threats has removed that usurpation threat. Uh, Edward IV made the mistake the first time he came to the throne by not having Henry VI, or not finding Henry VI and having Henry VI killed. The second time when he came to the throne, Henry VI died of melancholy. There is blood on the hair that was tested within the, the grave or the coffin. So Edward IV, Richard's brother, dealt with a usurpation threat pretty solidly, if you ask me. Uh, and, and so have previous monarchs. So it's not out of character with the British monarchy or the English monarchy to remove a usurpation threat. I think... It's just the issue that we're children. Like King John gets a bad rap because he allegedly murdered his nephew, Arthur. So it's that, I mean, there's, there's plenty of other reasons why John's a bad king, but 
um it's i think it's that attachment to it being children yeah uh absolutely and the, the new tv show puts forward four pieces of evidence and i i wondered whether you were because at the end of it i thought i thought it was rather an iffy show to be honest and by the end they seem to have judge rinder and philippa langley both seem to come to the conclusion that We've solved it. It's done. You know, the, they, they, the two boys escaped and became challengers, rivals to Richard III. But the four pieces of evidence that they present in this TV show, and listeners, I'll put a link in the show notes uh, if you are able to watch it. Were you in any way convinced by by the by the? And I'll I'll just list them out. So there's a um, there's a receipt that's been found for an army and weapons for Edward V. There is an uh, uh, There are some archives in Austria that show marks on the body of Richard, the Duke of Richard, Duke of York, that are the same as those as the challenger, the rival, the escaped boy, supposedly. Uh, there is a document the it's called the Gelder's document, which is of Richard's biography. So this is this boy supposedly escapes and then recites his life and this is shown as proof and then finally there is a receipt for uh, or a document promising 30,000 florins for Richard to challenge Henry the 7th I think this is so these are the four separate pieces of evidence are you in any way does this does this make make you agree with Philippa Langley that you know we've solved it? It's all we can all go home. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to caveat this. Firstly, I think Philippa Langley is a fantastic historian who has has drawn a lot of attention to medieval history, where medieval and particularly to a medieval period that hasn't had a lot of attention popularly. However, however, and I know everyone thought that however was going to come. I think a lot of these documents were lacking in a large amount of provenance, which would have helped us, well, is this really, Richard? Is this really happening here? You know, the the, the reciting of the, the story of Richard, okay, like I could sit down now and, and write a story and recite my life or recite and pretend to be someone else and be precise about it. And someone could go, oh, that looks very precise. That That must be him. I don't necessarily agree with that. Uh, and and it's equally as easy to turn up and say that you're someone who hasn't been seen for many years. But also, I think there was a lot of there was a lot of, lot of context missing from the debate. There was a lot put on Richard and Edward's sister Margaret, which I think there was a lot of provenance missing there as well. Now, what was Margaret's motivation for supporting someone who might? have been Richard. Well, Henry had killed her brother in battle. Henry had taken the throne from her family, who had taken the throne from another family. So I think the provenance that was missing from these documents didn't sway me at all, probably pushed me further in the way that I already am. Uh, and I think the missing context from the situation just sensationalised it all a bit, which... Yes, it's the TV program. It's an hour and a half. I'll have to read the book. I haven't read the book yet, but yeah, it's probably made me. It's it, it's entrenched my views a bit more um, that they were probably murdered than escaped to Europe. Oh, that's interesting. So the uh, documentary did the opposite of what it sought to do in your case. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I went in. I went into it with an open mind because I've. I'm I'm fairly I was fairly ambiguous about it. Like, oh, okay, might be, might be. I'll, I'll listen to what Philippa has to say. She was, she, she was fantastic with Richard III. But yeah, after looking at all those, what was on that documentary? I mean, I watched it with my parents, and they were just like, "Can you shut up?" So uh, yeah, I think it's kind of entrenched that that worldview that I have about that particular situation. Yeah, I I I found it interesting that at the end and the two. Rinder and, and, and Langley both sort of, it's clear, it's done. I thought that was just slightly ridiculous. But also, I think the evidence or the, the documents that they did find, I'd have no doubt that they were from the period. I think they had been dated and the, had a number of experts had come in and looked at it and, and agreed with them. It's just whether they're genuine rather than, you know, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, it's like it's like if you look at anything that um, Mancini writes from for Henry and Tudor. You, if you take away the providence, you're like, oh, okay, like Richard was a horrible king. And then if you add in, you know, Henry the Tud- Henry Tudor's court historian um, Mancini, you're like, oh, like I can understand now why that has that particular slant. So the missing provenance and missing context for a lot of that just yeah did not did not help and you can't solve that case at all like very and very much as who was jack the ripper yeah we can have some idea of who he might have been but until you know time travels invented we probably can't find out who murdered the boys or if the boys were murdered at all so yeah it's a difficult one uh, and channel four did a very good job of selling that one to be honest i, I i've got to give props to channel four do you know what I really liked about that documentary? It was the animations. I thought that was really the animations that sort of um, were telling the story of the the two boys. It was actually really, I really liked it, the way they did that. Um, I don't know if that's damning the documentary with faint praise, but uh, that's, what, that's what I liked about it. I, I like the breadth of historians as well. Bring in, uh, I, I like to see, I like to see Nathan Ammon on there, I like to see Matt Lewis in there. I think it gave, alongside those uh, those animations which i'd like to see more of i think it introduces to far more historians who i think i'd like to see on telly a bit more as well i think what could have really improved it is if they'd had a, a program of about 45 minutes afterwards and, and this is you know probably the world of history demanding what they're unlikely to get but um a 45 minute to an hour's chat between you know like a panel discussion two historians Philippa Langley being one of them and, and another. And then and then Nathan Ammon and, and perhaps another historian on, on his side just thrashing it out. I think I think that would be quite interesting. I, I would have watched that right after that as well. I think that would have been... I think it would have helped contextualise a lot of the debate that Philippa had. Or even if Channel 4 had said, oh, we'll make a, a three-part series. I think that would have been quite nice as well. And I, I do feel bad for the Americans... Because from what I've heard, the Americans have cut certain parts out of the document- or documentary to make it shorter. So I think we're very lucky to have had that full hour and a half, to be honest. Yeah, it was it was longer than I, I expected it to be. Good stuff. So, okay. So looking at your list of, of episodes that you've done, uh, it's three years now. Maybe this is a good time for you to reflect and have a... Uh, are there any in particular that you're probably proudest of? This might help listeners of this podcast to see, you know, find find a good episode to to kick off with. As I'm a scholar of, I also write as well. So I'm, as I'm a scholar of totalitarianism and totalitarian regimes, I'm particularly interested in anything that has to do with Nazi Germany, Stalinist Russia, and China. Now I don't often get the opportunity to do something like that because sometimes if you cover that it's already been covered to death so you have to be very careful but the episode that i did with charles spicer on coffee of hitler um for me that was something that was i really really enjoyed doing because i was able to not only you know read the book and ask some questions and discuss it but i was able to use my own existing knowledge to talk about you know the different political leanings of nazi germany different effects of totalitarian ideologies on on germany and how the british diplomats were talking and dealing with that so i i really enjoyed that episode uh, and it's one of my books of the year to be honest uh, coffee of hitler is such a fantastic book and um, i think i think i read it all in an evening just sitting there just absolutely captured by the book and the topics within it so coffee of hitler was one of my absolute favorites this year i've heard i've heard good things about it so this is about certain british individuals who i guess were they trying to modify the Nazis in some way? Which yes, they were part of that Anglo-German fellowship friendship group who were trying to encourage prior to the war, trying to encourage the British to interact with the Nazis to to, to try and maintain peace uh, in Europe, but also maintain those lines of communication. They fil- facilitated David Lloyd George going over there and having a meeting with Hitler. They facilitated Neville Chamberlain going over there and having a meeting. So. When you look at it on the surface and you thought oh, Britain didn't do enough, but when you look in the background, there are individuals there trying to to maintain peace. It's it's one of those hidden histories which is I think need to be out there a bit more. Yeah, because I think it's interesting you say that because the British uh, when one thinks of the Nazis and Brits, it's obviously those awful Mitford sisters. 
And then there are, you know, various aristocrats who show a lot of sympathy and interest in the Nazis as well. I guess this is a, another side of British involvement in the, the rise of the Nazis and the Nazis in power. Yeah, it definitely presents pro-German ideas, but not particularly pro-Nazi ideas. So I think we've all got into that kind of viewpoint that anyone who was pro-Germany or pro-peace within or prior to World War II was a Nazi. Not everyone who wanted peace and was pro-interaction uh, with Germany was a Nazi. And I think that's it's exposed that narrative a little bit more, which... I think it's been unfair to taint everyone with the same brush and just go, well, everyone who liked Germany was a Nazi when it obviously, obviously wasn't. And it, I think it gives a lot. It rings true for some things today as well, where you look at certain regimes and people who are pro bringing certain regimes into the international political arena today and everyone tainting them with the same brush. Meanwhile, it, you can say, actually, they're just pro this country and these people, not pro the regime. It's that nuance of history, isn't it? I mean, because we know that the Second World War began in 1939 and we had the Holocaust. I mean, we've got that knowledge. Of course, they didn't know that prior. And World War One had been so catastrophic that the idea of preventing war was, it, it wasn't exactly a niche belief i mean winston churchill was in the minority really wasn't he yeah and i i think i think we all tend to i think world war ii has changed our attitude towards war and peace where after world war one it was never again we're not doing that again try and search for any alternatives towards peace and i think now we perhaps post world war ii we perhaps have a a different slant where if you can't make sure there's peace through peaceful peaceful methods we still have these forces to ensure that things don't get as bad as that again. I was looking at some of the episodes that you've done and one particular uh, sprung out was with Simon Elliott, who did an Alexander the Great versus Julius Caesar discussion. And, well, listeners will know that Alexander the Great, I haven't actually done an episode on Alexander but he looms large. He's on the logo. He is, I, I'm a huge admirer of Alexander. But yeah, that was one episode that particularly sprung out. And Simon Elliott is a hugely enthusiastic historian of the of, of the ancient world, isn't he? I love Simon. As, as you probably look through the, the episode list, Simon has come onto the podcast more than anyone else. I think he's come on four or five times now. And a lot of my, my knowledge of the medieval world is, has come from Simon. Uh, but that episode was the first time I've worked with Simon. And to, to compare Caesar and Alexander, which I had previously never touched upon in my academic history life at all, it was fascinating because I learned so much about the period and I learned so much about their military tactics. It was two years ago now, so it is very faint, very faint memories for me now. But I didn't realise how much the ancient world can inform my understanding of not only my own work, but inform my understanding of other people's work as well. Yeah, it helped me contextualise what's happening in the periods, what's happening, you know, post Rome. So a lot of those medieval ideas that I discussed with, you know, Ashley Mantle, uh, Steve Tipple, I'm seeing uh, motifs repeating from the Roman period and, and from Alexander's Macedonian Empire, which is, which is actually really fun to kind of touch upon those themes a bit more. And then when I talk to Simon again, I'm like, oh, this is really interesting. Um, I saw this in this episode, so. Yeah, it's, it's always great to work with Simon and, and work on from that moment. Yeah, the ancient world is something that um, I'm always keen on on covering that kind of that kind of period. I, I did one that I was hugely excited about to talk to an academic called James Rom, who is um, an American historian and, and very interested in the period after the death of Alexander. And I was so excited. And this, the, the, I'm going to admonish my own listeners now. And well... Those that listened, I won't admonish, but those that didn't, I will, because I thought, oh, this is this is the best one I've ever done. I loved it. And uh, the listener numbers were not the same as, I don't know, anything on Nazi Germany or or some of the other episodes I've done. Um, 
I, I find it hugely unpredictable as to which will do well and, and, and which won't. Yeah, that's that's one of those ones that you have an episode where you're like, I love this topic. I'm so well prepared. I've done great questions. And everyone else is like, no, I want to listen to World War II. Uh, so I understand your pain on that. Um, but yeah, I think that's the one thing about history podcasting that I've liked. Like, I do like looking at my figures. We all like looking at our figures. But I think it's one thing that I've quite liked doing this year is looking at my figures, experimenting with topics to see what people want to listen to. And at the end of the day, you just go, you know what? People aren't going to listen to it, but at least I've got that content out there. And, you know, in five years' time, like like I've had this year, before no one listened to Roman content, and then the Roman Empire became a train, trending to- uh, topic on TikTok, and then all my Roman content ended up getting more plays within a few weeks. So I was like, oh, all right. So at least you have a body of content there for people to, to touch on when Alexander the Great becomes a trending topic. Indeed, it will happen. It will happen. It will happen. All right, Jackson. I know we'd mentioned talking about interesting historical topics. Is there anything that uh, particularly you wanted to talk about? I think at the moment, you know, discussing there's there's two looming large, and I think you've covered them quite a bit without getting into all the discussions about today. But Russia, China, and the Middle East, you've seemed to have covered it quite a lot on aspects of history. Why why have you? decided to take those stances and cover those regions well i'm very interested in current affairs and so that's the main reason really and one can always find a historical narrative behind what's happening today i think sometimes that's maybe overplayed but i think also if we take the war in ukraine as an example, and I've had a number of Serhi Plokhi's episodes that actually had quite a big Im- impact on me. It's because it was an, it's an existential conflict. This is a totalitarian state to all intents and purposes invading a, okay, not a perfect democracy, but a democracy nonetheless. And so that, you know, that's to me was a historic moment. Plus the fact that aspects of history is called aspects of history means I've got quite a bit of flexibility and can get away with that kind of thing. So yeah, that's in particular for the war in Ukraine, you know, just because it has that sort of historical significance. And then with, uh, we I covered Israel-Palestine with a, a interesting academic Italian based in America. And that did really well, actually, inevitably, I suppose. But I was very nervous about it because one doesn't want to present too lopsided a view. I'm sure you appreciate that. And I just wanted to give some listeners a little bit of basic background as to we are where we are. So we went up to the um, 1967 war. And it was really because, again, this I think the attacks on October the 7th were so horrific and then the extraordinary response from the Israeli military since means that it's been dominating our newspapers. And because of the historical aspects, it seemed to me to be a kind of natural uh, episode to, to put in there, really. I, I mean, certainly agree with your assessment that Russia is totalitarian and, and the brutality of those those attacks and, and the responses. Do you Do you then see giving context and background as part of your your duty as a historian and a historical content creator? I suppose so. I, my first duty is to try and help historians get their voice out. And equally, alongside, is to make an entertaining episode for the listeners. So, I mean, if I really wanted to do what I want the whole time, maybe I would be doing more stuff on i don't know israel palestine i think i've 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 done a bit of overkill on the ridley scott napoleon film i suspect the listeners might be getting a little bit sick of us going on about the ridley scott film it's just because it was you know him talking about his comments on historians i found really quite entertaining i find it difficult to get upset by that kind of stuff i found it quite amusing and so when I have a historian on or an author, a historical fiction author, I'm very keen to see what they think. But a duty, I suppose so, but not that would probably be slightly too, I don't want to sound like I'm too pompous. Ultimately, these podcasts are a bit of fun and entertainment. And I do take a slightly, I'm not deadly serious on on all my episodes, 
although I was for Israel Palestine. No, I, I can understand that. First, I, I fully agree with getting a historian's voice out there. It's something that I'm particularly keen on and passionate about as well. Um, but it's it's like you said, it's that fine line of being entertaining, educating, but also trying to fit the moment. Like you said about Napoleon and and all these conflicts, everyone's creating content about them. It's it's sometimes it's hard to sit in that sound and really educate, but make a difference and at points. So taking that entertaining stand, I think it's a key way of where you do it, and I, I quite like that. Well, there's a particular historian who I have on quite regularly called Gordon Corrigan. And Gordon's just brilliant. He's hilarious. He doesn't care that it's 2024. And he's just a voice from a like a different period. And I hope he wouldn't mind me saying that. But I, I he's hugely knowledgeable on military history. Uh, but he's very funny with it. And so I've I've had him on to talk about I've got some French listeners dwindling French listeners because we've covered Cressy Poitier Waterloo, and then I've started doing a Great British Commanders series, which Gordon is an ever present. So if listeners are ever worried that Gordon won't be on one of those episodes, that's not, not going to be the case. He's he'll be on all of them, and he's just so amusing to listen to, and he always has something interesting to say. He's not conformist. So, for example, Montgomery, the British general during the Second World War, Gordon doesn't rate him in any way, really. And that's always quite refreshing to hear. So that's a little sort of warm up for the listeners, because we're going to be doing a uh, our Great British series. Commanders continues with the also rounds of the 20th century. So we're going to we're going to do World War Two also rounds because Slim was our top commander for the British commander for the Second World War. And Gordon covers all the also rounds and he really does stick the knife in uh, to Montgomery. No, I'm, I'm, I'll look forward to listening. But, you know, how do you choose those those topics then to discuss different areas? Because I think it's it's something that we don't, as historical content creators, we don't often talk about how we choose uh, what we talk about. So how do you make those decisions to, to well, create that well i thought that okay if we take that series do something on the great british commanders i thought it might be popular so it also coincided with the publication of slim's short stories that he'd written there's a series of three short stories which i'd uh, recommend and so i thought oh well, what, what better way to promote slim if he's not around to promote himself is to get his biographer on and gordon who served in the same regiment as Slim to, to have a chat about the, him as a commander, and and it did really well. So I thought, oh, okay, I'll just carry it on. And so I named it in that way. I thought, oh, okay, if I name it like that, then it'll look like there are more coming. And it did well. So I just thought, oh, we'll keep on going. So I think we're going to keep on going down to the medieval period. We've started Second World War. We'll go through the Victorian era. We'll go, you know, Napoleonic Wars, we'll go down to Seven Years' War. We'll keep on going, I think. And Gordon will be there for all of it because Gordon can cover it. If it's military history, Gordon's up for it. It's always nice when you have a guest like that you can use and, and go back to. I think, yeah, the oh, way I don't you... use him. Don't uh, Jackson, that's oh, an outrageous oh, slur. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh... <laughs> Yeah, you got me there. Yeah, I do slightly use him, but he like we 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 have a good we have a good enjoyable chat. We, it's um, mutually beneficial. That's yeah, a... yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think it's a different. I think it's a slightly different approach, really, because I tend to because a lot of my work is done on interviewing historians on their books, and I tend to get requests or get requests from publishers and 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 sift through those to see what i find interesting what might hit those out like again with the algorithms but everyone's creating stuff about what's happening in the moment and sometimes i'm trying to challenge that and go somewhere else and, and give another event so that people have a relief from what's happening or add something that's slightly different from the general view you know like with uncrowned or an episode that i've got come up uh, coming up on powerful medieval women decentralizing the narrative from people who are in power or where the narrative has mainly been around powerful men centering it around you know what who were these women actually without the con like trying to take away the context of their husbands or their children or looking at things in a slightly different way i think it 
expands what you can understand about history and expands history for for people who aren't necessarily in touch with up-to-date historical research good stuff so you've got that coming up then what else have you got coming up that you're uh, looking forward to oh i've got a stack i've got a stack of books that i need to be reading but i'm looking forward to talking to steve about the crusaders again I, I yes love he's just written uh the, the templars yes that is a fantastic book that is an absolutely fantastic book so i've read that one i've done an episode with steve on that and then i will be working with steve again this year on his his two previous books about crusader armies and crusader strategies so i'm looking forward to to diving into that and i'm looking forward to covering some festivals as well through the podcast so next weekend i'm covering the catherine of aragon festival doing is that in spain post- no, it's unfortunately it's in Peterborough. Peterborough, not, yeah, not quite as sunny, not quite as warm, and the food's not quite as good. But well, she spent most of her life here, so I suppose that's yeah part of it. But yeah, it'll be it'll be interesting to do some live podcasting again. I really enjoy doing live podca- podcasting, so that'll be yeah, you, be pretty it, fun. That's really interesting. Yeah, you, I like your little snippets; they're really good, like sort of ten minutes quick chats and a festival dedicated to Catherine of Aragon. Yes, an entire, entire festival dedicated to Catherine of Aragon's life. So there are religious ceremonies, there are Catholic ceremonies, there are reenactors reenacting Tudor courts when Catherine would have been there. There are a Tudor walks and tours of Peterborough. Um, so it's going to be a really, really exciting event. And and to look at the the history of my hometown through the context of someone who is so immensely popular at the moment uh, is going to be really quite fun to do, actually. So I'm looking forward to to doing that and walking around with my microphone and probably my winter coat to make sure I'm warm enough. Well, she was very hard done by, so I think that's an absolutely wonderful festival to have that so many hundreds of years after her death that she is commemorated after being treated so badly by Henry VIII. I totally agree that she was badly badly sidelined probably it was probably emotional abuse as well at some point so i'm I'm very happy to do my little bit to to maintain catherine's catherine's memory and, and pay a little bit of homage to her but what are you excited for uh, aspects of history this year because um, it's a big well, year well we're launching a new podcast and um so there'll be more on this soon for listeners but we're launching a new podcast on the first of february which is the spy masters which is a podcast on spies. And so that'll be exciting, but that's going to be run by Antonia Senior, who's the historical fiction reviewer for The Times. So she's launching that channel. For aspects of history, I've got a few episodes coming up. Well, obviously, I've mentioned the Great British Commander series. I'm looking to, I've got a conversation on Checkpoint Charlie and, and East Berlin. I've got the Mau Mau Uprising in Kenya. Um, that's very interesting. That is a, I think there's a lot more to, I've received this book written by Nicholas Rankin. It's fascinating. Um, sort of personal history alongside the uh, the Mau Mau uprising, which was a, for listeners who aren't familiar, it was in colonial Kenya, Kenya as it was called in those days, a uprising, Brutal uprising and then brutally put down by the British. So it's a one of those nasty little wars where no one comes out of it looking well. And so that's particularly interesting. And I've got a... I'm just trying to think what else I've got. Uh, I must have a lot more, which my momentarily gone blank. Oh, yes, we're going to be doing a limited series for authors to dive into their books. So we'll have three or four episodes where we'll take a story from history and we'll cover it in great detail. So that'll be something that is more of a deep dive than my sort of singular episodes that I do. Oh, I'm really looking forward to those deep dives. But I saw that when I saw that Spy Masters announcement come up on my social media, I was like, wow, I need to listen to that. That just looked absolutely fascinating. So I'm, it's 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 a bit of a growth there for Aspects of History, which is, it sounds Yeah, fun. yeah. Well, we'll see how it goes. But um, Antonia is, so she herself is wor- working on a book on the Cambridge Spy Ring. Kim Philby and all that. And she's interviewing some really interesting authors. In particular, she's interviewing David McCloskey, who's this new novelist who was a former CIA officer. And he's written novels. And I, having spoken to Antonia, she tells me that he's been quite willing to um, 
I don't think betraying secrets. I probably shouldn't say that, but he's been quite um, interesting, I'll say. And then uh, General David Petraeus, who is the US Army general who was the director of the CIA for a year. And so that's going to be, I think, quite interesting. And one wonders whether he'll reveal any state secrets on, on that episode. And if you miraculously disappear, then I know what's happened. So Exactly. That's... <laughs> Jackson, look, this has been fantastic. Thank you very much. No, it's all right. And I've got one final oh, yes. question for you, actually. Oh, God. So this is something that I do at the History of Jackson podcast every single episode without fail. You know, what you've covered so much and you've you've discussed some of it that you've already touched on today, but what has been your favourite piece of history across your life as a historian, in school, university? What has been your favourite piece of history that you have looked at, featured, written about read i would say then i this is a sort of an emotional thing where i used to read sharp when i was about 10 i first started reading sharp when i was about 10 or 11 and i just obsessed with it and it got me into uh, the whole period the napoleonic period you know not only the history but also some of the writing thackeray's vanity fair for example and the Battle of Waterloo. So I would probably say, and and that whole Napoleonic period, I'm fascinated by. I, I like that. I I always like the emotional, personal answers to those those questions because I think it shows historians more of more off as people instead of just what people think we are. We're just hermits sitting in our offices writing books and writing articles and not interacting. So I like that. So thank you very much. Well, well, historical fiction was a real. Uh, I we we promote historical fiction authors as well. We we love historical fiction and aspects of history. And when you're at a boarding school and you're young, that's the one of the few things that gives you a bit of escapism. So yeah, very much so. I I like that. So thank you for that. Thank you for sharing that. No probs. Great. So we're done. There are no more special questions. I think that that was our fi- that was our final fun question. So, yeah, thank you very much. Jackson, thanks so much. Thank you very much for having me. And thank you for coming on mine as well. (laughs) Yeah, I know. We're both thanking each other for being on each other's podcasts. So that was the episode that I recorded with Oliver Webb Carter from Aspects of History. It was great to talk to Oliver. I'm sure you heard how much we enjoyed recording that episode. This episode has also appeared on the Aspects of History podcast feed as well. So if you enjoyed the work that Oliver did within this episode, do go and check out Aspects of History. It's a great platform. They got do they do some great work. In the description to the links to interact with everything Aspects of History do will be in the description below. Now, if you enjoy the content that we do here at History of Jackson, please do consider subscribing and supporting us through History of Jackson Plus on Apple Podcasts, the Buy Me a Coffee profile in the description below, or by checking out any of the other work that we do here, either via the blog, on the TikTok and Instagram pages as well. Next episode is another awesome episode. You can learn so much from it yet again. And I look forward to speaking with you and learning with you all again next episode.